I welcome everyone to Send Education Wednesday, April 3rd, 1.30 in the afternoon. Uh, I think we have a question oh, here. The, oh. the phone panel, just have a blue one. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. You're higher. Right. So if you could go grab my phones. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, so we are continuing. Yesterday, uh, we had a walkthrough, very comprehensive, very good walkthrough, H630. This is uh, the Boards of Cooperative Education Services, also known as BOCES. Uh, Representative Buss did a great job, as did Ledge Council. And now we're starting to dig in and have some testimony. So with that, Mr. Francis, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm Jeffrey Francis. I'm the Executive Director for the Vermont School Superintendents Association. Happy to be here with you today. I did have the opportunity to watch your testimony nearly in its entirety yesterday. So the walkthrough, Representative Buss's comment. And I decided <clears throat> at that point of watching them not to give you anything in writing because, <clears throat> not because I wouldn't stand by what I said, but it was rather conversational and I thought it might go that way in this direction too. Um, so I've highlighted the bill and specific sections that I want to speak to but I first wanted to start contextually, and I hope that this responds in certain ways to the conversation that you were having yesterday. <clears throat> first, somebody, and I don't know who to attribute this to, talked about the utilization of this legislation, if it's enacted, to support the field in uh, organically growing scale and efficiency. And I thought that that was a useful comment because Sometimes when we think about the education delivery system in Vermont, we don't think about the diversity of the types of school districts that we have. Um, we've got districts that would rival, I think, any suburban community in the country, all the way to the most rural districts you could find. Um, and the purpose of this BOCES bill, at least as I understand it, um, and the Superintendent's Association does support it, would to enable the collaboration of districts regionally to take advantage of their um, collaboration to improve both the cost and the delivery of services um, around nearly any element of what we try to accomplish in public education. Um, another way to illustrate that um, is a, as a example that I often um, bring up when we talk both about the diversity of the systems and also the nature of what they're trying to accomplish. And this goes back to probably 2013 or 2012 when there was a real focus on um, unfunded mandates, which occasionally comes up. And because the members of the Superintendents Association were so interested in that topic, we actually had a meeting over at Two Prospect Street, which you visited. We had about half the superintendents in the state at the meeting. There were 30 or so there. And we spent a whole day looking at mandates. And in the morning, we looked at a 15-year history of what had been asked of school districts. And in the afternoon, we talked about the ability of the school districts to respond to those mandates. And I will not forget this, and I won't mention the names, but I will tell you that this is true. One superintendent from the Chittenden County region was very invigorated and enthusiastic. And as we went through the list of the mandates, she said, no problem with that one, no problem with that one, no problem with that one. And literally at the other end of the table, I looked and there was a superintendent who practically had their head on the table. And I said to that person, I said, what's wrong? And he said, I'm, observe, I'm observing Elaine, to, oh, now you know who it was, um, <laughs> Um, we knew we to talk about their <laughs> talk about their ability to get all this stuff done. Yeah. She said, "In my system, we don't have an ability to get any of it done." And a lot of it had to do with access to resources, the density of the population, what they had for staff, perceptions in the community of what they needed for staff. Um, was this a rural community? Yeah, it was as yeah. rural as you yeah. could get, and um, but a large system. So when you think about the notion of equity, and that came up yesterday and what you're going to provide to kids in their systems based on the characteristics of those systems, which I think we have a tendency to underestimate. We've got a real focus on 
um, equity for students. I don't think we are as focused on equity within the systems themselves. And I won't go off on a tangent on that right now, but I will say that um, <coughs> challenge around equity is exacerbated in a year where you see 30 school district budget debates, because we've got districts that are going in the wrong direction in terms of the resources that they need. Um, so when I, when I, I a district, sure, but that's really interesting as people, maybe you already have that, back to what you said about the town's perspective on what the district may or may not need. Right. I'm sure people are going to continue to analyze that third that went down for a long time. Mm -hmm. And it's, yeah, it, there's a lot there. Sure. Right, right. Yeah. So with respect to the BOCES bill, this was not initiated by the Superintendent's Association. I can't think about House member who were the sponsors of the bill. We started to pay attention to it um, closely when it came under serious conversation over there. And just like um, you will have on Friday with superintendent witnesses, they testified over there. And I took note of the witnesses that you have on Friday um, and three of them are going to have very specific experience with BOCES. And I think that this is important, too, in terms of how you think about this bill. So Brooke Olson Farrell, she lives in New York, and she sort of came out of the New York system. She's got a lot of familiarity with BOCES in New York and how they work. Mike Leichleiter, who was a superintendent in the greater Lancaster, Pennsylvania area, but is now over here at Harwood. Unified Union School District, he's got familiarity with the Pennsylvania system. And Andy Skarzynski, who was a principal in Rutland and then went over to Wyndham Southeast, Brattleboro, mm -hmm. um, left as superintendent in Wyndham Southeast and now is an uh, employee at a BOCES down in, um, in the greater New Haven, Connecticut area. I think when they come in on Friday, they'll, they'll each speak from their relative perspective. <clears throat> I think the point that I want to make by that is these BOCES derive their shape. I, and I, by shape, I don't mean their physical configuration, but I'll speak to that. They, their shape in terms of the services that they provide based on what the needs are, educational, operational, for the school districts they serve to circle all the way back to the issue of equity, if the district in the Northeast Kingdom that I was referring to had been on the outer ring of Chittenden County, where a superintendent was saying, we can perform all this, if there was access to a BOCES in that region, then you really have the ability to invoke the phrase sort of rising tide floats all boats through collaboration, well-managed collaboration, concentrated collaboration, I believe that you can get better cost efficiency and you can get better product in terms of the education that you can provide in your system through that collaboration. I don't have a script, so I can't go off script, but I'll tell you what that causes me to think about. Supervisory unions and some of the conversation yesterday was, are we adding in a extra layer of bureaucracy? I would say if you consider supervisory unions in their current context, that 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 is a very reasonable question. You know, Act 46 was intended to get school district configurations, not create um, more elaborate supervisory union structures. And the difference is right now we've got districts that serve six, seven towns. It's a single district, one board, one administration, one central office. Supervisory unions, which is, I would maintain, while it still exists, it's an antiquated model, may have as many as in the Northeast Kingdom. One school district or supervisory union has 15 boards. Hard to operate. If you put a BOCES in to that system, then it's, it seems like you do have too much uh, bureaucracy and, and potential for additive costs. If you have a collection of school districts who have a single board and a single superintendent, the notion of collaboration 
it gets that much stronger. Mm -hmm. the, the last point that I'm making in terms of sort of the overview is that when I think about BOCES, and I want to speak specifically to some of the components in this bill, um, one of the things you could gain if these were well operated is an ability to respond to the plethora of new legislation that's passed every year. Because when you think about implementation of any single piece of legislation, for right now there's uh, 56 central offices, superintendents and central offices in Vermont. When you pass legislation, they have to like divert their focus to enact that legislation. They've got to deploy staff within their central office. They have to concern themselves with how they're going to follow the law. If you have a BOCES type structure, then the responsibility for responding to that and supporting school districts and responding to that can be assigned to those BOCES. Can you give us an example? Because the way that we talked about it yesterday was just, I mean, in my mind, it's its like the purchasing power, yeah. the, uh, you know, maybe you become an expert in some area. Can you, like, well, like I'm just thinking of, all right, so we just passed the literacy bill. Yeah. You know, is there a way that you see BOCES helping to implement a bill like that? Yes, I do. And, you know, very deep in my testimony here, um, and I, I'll try not to, you know, to sort of go on too long. One of the points that came up in the House was a concern that BOCES would be used to allow the Agency of Education to abdicate its own responsibility in terms of professional learning, right? So. Yeah. To your left, Mr. Chair, is Colin Robinson. They talk a lot about Act 173 and what wasn't done as well as it could have been. Mm -hmm. um, but if you think about literacy and teacher training um, as one element, if you think about the ability to provide special services to children within the region itself rather than have to send them away, if you talk about things like purchasing collaboratives, which right now, if you ask business managers, you know what the value is in purchases, purchasing collaboratives, it's a debatable point based on the efficiency of the collaboratives themselves. A BOCES, and this bill allows for this, has a lot of opportunity for the region, boards and administrators, to make decisions about how they want to deploy their collaboration based on what the pressure points are. So, on the on the issue of abdication of responsibility, I mean, and I'm, I'm gonna I'll comment on this too. Right now, the education delivery system is in a state of flux because the field thinks that the agency should be responding in one manner, and the agency hasn't responded that way, right? So it's not a secret that there's not a lot of confidence in the agency right now on the part of the field. Um, the agency would still have a role and should. But you can imagine if you had these regional collaboratives working well, that the, you know, sort of the closer you get to the school system itself, the more effective your training could be. It would also be, in the case of training, directed by um, the school districts themselves, not by the agency. So right now, and I think Jay, who's going to testify after I will, you know, there are there are effective collaboratives right now like Champlain Valley, it's education development. Champlain Valley Educator Development Center. Right. This the southeastern corner of the state from um, Hartford all the way then down to Brattleboro, they've already formed up a BOCES like entity. Um but, you know uh but so the point is I think there's a lot of utility to this bill if it's implemented well. I think with a, with a state system that has as much diversity and is as challenged as, as it is right now, I think it would, enabling legislation would be useful when you envision a more efficient and effective structure. There's some specific points in here that, I, that I'll refer to though, that you, know, you might want, if, if you think it's a good way to proceed, you might wanna um, lay your hands on this bill with regard to improving it. But in terms of the overall context, um, I think it's a, a useful piece of legislation um, uh, and, and, and could be beneficial to um, achieving both responding to the findings and um, 
achieving the examples of functions that are articulated on the first four pages of the bill. Mr. Francis, I, I, I tend to agree with you that it could be really effective in a good piece of legislation. The only thing, and I was thinking about this last night after we talked, and I'm curious to know your thoughts. There seem to be, and you alluded to it, so many moving parts right now. Yeah. We have a senator that would like to change the state board. And there's a senator who might want to dissolve the state court. We have people in, in the other body that might want to go back to a commissioner. We have uh, people who are thinking about consolidation. What I'm wondering is if, in a way, does this all... I hate the piecemeal piece of all the things I just talked about. Yeah. And so that's where I'm struggling. Is there more of an opportunity to kind of take all of these issues out there and really kind of put them together in some way that allow us to take steps forward? Yeah. Does that make sense? I mean, there's just a zillion little things yeah. out there. It makes a lot of sense. Um, and... It's rare that you hit the... And I should say, I don't know if I, we should dissolve the state. Yeah. I'm just saying... No, that no, no, yeah. no. And uh, Let me respond with that way. Um, this way. You've got a piece of legislation that was um, well vetted in the House. Mm -hmm. I thought the conversations that I watched yesterday were indicative of the fact that you're going to give it the same kind of attention. Mm -hmm. um, I think that... Um, your decision around this bill ought to consider the question you just asked in terms of moving pieces. <clears throat> I think that something you ought to think about is if you have a bill which is enabling, right? And I, I want to refer to, I want to go, I'm going to speak to the dates of implementation of this here in a minute. If you've got something that is going to be construed as useful, and you think that changes in the system are going to be uneven in terms of how they take hold, that I think that this would not be a bad piece of legislation to pass, to have available to people as the state moves in certain ways in different regions. Now that doesn't answer the big questions about like what's the future of the education delivery system overall. Right. But if you if you believe that no matter what happens, there's always going to be some number of school districts. Mm -hmm. like 50 school districts or 40 school districts, mm -hmm. and they're going to have the general proximities that they have right now, and you're still going to be asking them to do different things every year, which I, I would bet my last dollar that you will, mm -hmm. then I think that this kind of a collaborative opportunity with structure makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, if you said, well, we really don't want to, you know, we're going to like, flatten the whole system or potentially go to one school district only, um, then I think the issue of supporting the schools in that district sort of changes the context. Mm -hmm. But if we're going to have something that resembles a traditional education delivery system with some number of school districts, with some number of superintendents and central offices, mm -hmm. then I think that this is a useful framework to have in place. So, you know, I took note of the fact that um, in the findings, they say that Vermont's only one of nine states that doesn't yeah, have a yeah, policy structure yeah, right yeah. now. That's, that, that's why I think well, on Friday you're going to have um, three different superintendents, one of whom is now in Connecticut, talking about how, what the what, it, what the form is there. One of the challenges that they had in the House Education Committee was Brooke Holtz and Farrell, who um, is going to testify here on Friday, it provided that the oil spill that they're dealing with the, the school down there. Wow. takes care of, you know, that she can get away. Um, she'll talk about, you know, the New York system. Um, people, they have different perspectives about how, how it could work. I think that if you pass enabling legislation, then we'll probably get a, a Vermont method for how it could work. Um, so I, I wouldn't, you know, I don't think you're subject to criticism if you say we're going to wait, but I think that there's some utility to acting on it if you bring yourself to that place. Um, I, I'll, if you want, I can, did you want, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm going to get into specific points okay, now, yeah, but yeah. so I can answer questions generally. We have until three, just so folks. Okay. Oh, oh, well, we have a bunch of witnesses. Okay. Yeah. Not just with Mr. Francis. No. <laughs> okay. Um, two quick questions. You mentioned implementation yeah. and you may not be the person to answer this, but what would that look like? I'm so unclear what implementation looks like and who would really be in charge of okay. it. Okay. Yeah. 
If I may, let me, uh, the next point I was going to make speaks to that question. All right, and then I wanted to ask you a question about supervisory. Okay. So, um, my reading of the bill allows the formers of these BOCES, which are the school districts themselves, to make determinations about the functions of the BOCES within the context of their organization agreements. So it would be the boards of the, so if you took a look at um, any one of your regions and had a BOCES that was formed up by, let's say 12 school districts, each school district would have a representative on the board and they would meet as a deliberative body and make decisions about where they were gonna focus the BOCES. So the authority rests with the body politic, which is the BOCES system itself. Right now, and, and there was a reference in section two to formation of a board of cooperative education services shall be designed to build upon geographically focused cooperative regions <clears throat> used by Vermont superintendents. Since before I arrived at the Superintendents Association in the late 1990s, there were collaborations of superintendents in school districts in five regions of the state. And when the House looked at a BOCES bill, they looked at those five regions because they largely fall around geographical and transportation corridors. So there's the Champlain Valley, who you've met with as a legislator, that goes from the Canadian border to Middlebury and over to the spine of the Green Mountains. And then um, from all the communities south of Middlebury all the way down to um, Bennington or Powell. Um, and then there's the, uh, the Southeast region, which extends from Hartford all the way down to Brattleboro. Yep. And then and you've got that map. So um, those, it, the testimony yesterday by Representative Buss implied that those were not um, really active entities until the pandemic. They got a lot more right. active in the pandemic. They were meeting every day. Yeah. Prior to that, they would meet every month and they would work on issues that were common interest, but they were largely responding to what's happening in the legislature or what's happening you know, in the collective bargaining arena. Yeah. And less, they focused less on implementation. The notion of the BOCES would beat that up the region seemed to hold reasonably. <clears throat> the reason the number went from five to seven, <clears throat> excuse me, and I had a role, I discussed that with the committee, was when you take a look at um, any one of the regions and the, the, the reach, like from the Canadian yes. border to Middlebury, yes. you've got both a long transportation route, but also you've got some different community dynamics. Um, so I, I, it was my suggestion. They had six. I said, why don't you make seven just because we're not sure yeah. when they form up, what the formation will be. So um, if I may respond, I so in my mind, as I still am trying to imagine what this would look like. So school boards are basically as a volunteer position. Mm -hmm. um, we know that the trend toward like civic engagement is diminishing mm -hmm. over time. Um, I mean, I'm just thinking about myself on a school board like, where would I get, where would these folks get the time to do what seems like a lot of work? And I'm also wondering if it's also extra work on the superintendent, because I heard you talk about boards and I heard you talk about superintendents. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm sure, I mean, obviously there's a way to do it because it's being done all over the country, but I'm still having a hard time picturing how it would get implemented. Yeah, we have a tough time, Ms. Senator Dulux, or alluding to even finding people to run right. for the legislature. Yeah, so. Yeah, uh, I think it's a great question. Um, If you think about what a BOCI would do, and let's say that you had <clears throat> a focus on purchasing, a focus on um, local but collaborative uh, programs for special needs students, and you had an emphasis on improving the training of reading teachers, okay? You can envision a scenario where you'd have a board of the BOCES that would make a determination that they were going to work on those three things. But the collaboration on each one of those functions 
the purchasing piece would go to business managers. Every school has one. Like, why don't your business managers get together and figure this out? The emphasis on um, programs for special needs students would go to the special ed directors who currently are searching for programs to put students into, and they would say, let's build a program that looks like this. That, a similar kind of thing's happening between Essex Junction, I mean, Essex Westford and South Burlington right now with the closure of some of the specialized schools up in Chittenden County. And on the issue of teacher training, you'd go to the curriculum leaders that will exist still in the school districts because you still have curriculum personnel working within the school district themselves. Right. So, you know, I think it's happening organically anyway. Yeah. It would just be kind of expanding on the already organic connections that are happening. Well, it, it points people toward a structure where currently no structure exists. Okay. Um, but may I just follow up on this? Uh, are you done, sir? Yeah. Uh, it seems like could, could there be some conflict then with, with school boards? In other words, I'm thinking of the, the teacher training piece or, or some of these other things. Do you see any possible conflict? I never see any possibility of conflict in any ex area of my life, including <laughs> this building. Until it happens. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no. I mean, you know what I'm trying yeah, to say? Yeah, they always, so they still so, governing bodies. Yeah. So one of the things I want to talk about is the implementation dates, right? So under the current legislation, by um, January, excuse me, July 1, 2026, school boards are supposed to make a decision, we see value in this and we want to pursue it, right. or we don't. Yeah. So I can envision a scenario where certain school districts are like, no, we're not going to do it. But other school districts will say, they'll look at any one of the areas of opportunity, or probably more, more realistically, a combination of those opportunities, and say, um, we're going to move in that direction. Now, here's a couple of things to ponder. One is the timing. Given the questions that you've all asked yourself about the current state of affairs for public education in Vermont, does it really make sense to ask school districts? We're sitting here, it's almost July 1, 2024. You, you pass this legislation, um, it's a real short window in the total scope of things to have people make decisions about whether they want to go there or not. So one of the notes that I have in this testimony is, I think it'd be worthwhile if you are, if you favor this approach, to, to talk to the House and say, if we change that date, if we push that date up by a year or two, to let the kinds of, the big questions that you were contemplating settle a little bit more uh, I would hope they would say, if you want to change that to 2027 or 2028, would be okay with that. Because I think that the shape of the delivery system is going to change under what the deliberations that are happening currently. So um, she, thank you. That, that was something I thought of uh, yesterday as well <clears throat> in looking at the effective date. And I think that it also kind of gets to the idea of how things are shaping up organically, uh, push it out by a year. And everybody knows that there's this structure that's coming, but it's a little bit down the road. It it, it, it kind of gives more of a mold for some of the organic um, interfacing to, uh, to to work with this and get ready for it um, as as it uh, gets to the effective date if it's pushed further. Yeah. I made a note. Yes. Um, I'm looking at page five now, where it says creation of board of cooperative education services organization, secretary approval, establishment of boards. When the boards of two or more unions vote to explore the advisability, I wrote my margin note. This is cost benefit analysis. Mm -hmm. So you would hope that school districts who are contemplating these look at this as a cost benefit analysis, whether it gains them efficiency and economy and improved service by joining a BOCES, BOCES versus uh, not joining a BOCES. I also will say, frankly, that I think some 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 school systems right now are not, they, they, you know, this kind of a question posed today would be paralyzing to some districts. They wouldn't be able to, they couldn't know what to do. Um, but I think if you gave them, if, if Cost containment and you know the whatever reconfiguration of the system we may see 
takes place over the next couple of years, they would presumably be better positioned to make decisions about it because, because even though the notion of creating this new structure may be challenging, I think that when you look at the statement of intent and the kinds of things that you might gain through a bill like this, I think that the efficiencies and economies um, in a well-developed, well-implemented system are, are probably going to materialize. Um, let me just wrap up with uh, a specific section of this that I'm a little bit confused by that I think would require more work if you're going to proceed on this bill is on page eight. Um, it's the it's section P on page eight. Mm -hmm. And it, I'll just read it. Read, it says, Agency of Education Promotion. The Agency of Education shall promote the use of BOCES as providers of education services and programs for local school districts and supervisory unions and shall include consideration of grant applications that include the use of education cooperatives for the purpose of procuring services and programs. I, I was in the House Education Committee when they talked about that language. It made sense to me at the time. I'm, I read it many times over, and I'm not really certain what it means today. And I, for starters, and this doesn't really go to the um, to what the plain meaning is of it, but I would change the word from promote to something like explain or describe, because if you've got objective judgments being made by local school boards with regard to the benefit of the BOCES in their region, mm -hmm. I think that they should probably be left to make that determination without promotion by the AOE. Um, because I think that ultimately the those communities are going to understand how that BOCES could work for them more so than the AOE. And when you promote, you need to promote in general terms. And I think that these service, th these BOCES are specific operations. They're not general operations. Um, and I think that the second half of that sentence, and shall include consideration of grant applications that include the use of cooperatives for the purpose of procuring services and programs. I think what's intended there is to say that BOCES can be considered for grant proposals from the agency itself. But but I I would urge you, and I may, you know, maybe it's so simple and I'm just missing a big point. But that's that's a section that I think would be worth getting a little bit more explanation on. Well, the word promote is loaded with bias right. to begin with. Right. And then if it's going to have an effect on who gets grants and that, yeah. Right. I agree. That's. And then the, on page 14, that is the transition report. That was the section where it says on or before July 1, 2026. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I wouldn't, you know, because as I already established, I don't like conflict. I wouldn't, on my say so, um, change that to 2027 or 2028, but I might send uh, the word emissary to the House Education Committee and ask if they if they're like, would they be amenable to a later date in order to let the whatever's happening with the system happen you know, for you ask districts to make those moves. Um, and that, so in general, I think it will be useful. I totally appreciate the fact that you've got an interest and concern about the overall state of the system. Um, Related to that, if I may, what if we were a future legislature, and I, and I think this is coming, uh, given everything out there, we move toward having fewer schools. Right. You know, we have well know the story for some last night also, certain school, I don't remember where it is, seven students are yeah. there. Uh, yeah. And does this in any way, would it prevent or armed? Would it sort of get in the way of closing school? I mean, how do you see that interaction? I think the services are district specific. So it's not. And the, and the school issues are going to be. Inter districts, right? Yep. And, you know, yep. they're going to need yep. to make considerations. Supervisory unions are a little different because you've got, you know, a lot of schools, a lot of school districts yeah. in one governing structure. But, you know, as you know, there's a lot of conversations going on, including in this committee, about what the future is. And if, if 
if you're going to reduce costs or the um, rate of increase of costs, mm -hmm. then you need to look at what the major cost centers are. And the major cost centers are personnel. 80% of the costs of operating school systems is in personnel. And another big cost center is the number of facilities that you operate. Yeah. And when you've got an analysis of the facilities in the state that we have in this state, with a large percent of them um, approaching their useful life, you've got an opportunity to make decisions. And I would add the qualifier hard decisions because this system is what it is because there's been a lot of, I, you know, in many instances, justifiable protectionist mentality around what it is we're going to retain. And the retention always goes to human resources and the physical buildings. We also, um, as I alluded to in my testimony, we're additive in terms of the requirements that we put on schools. So at the same time that we lament the number of schools that we operate and the number of personnel that we employ, we're adding things to them, both in the educational sphere and in the human service sphere. Um, you know, and we could, I can talk about that and you can too, what schools are doing and the expanding mission. But um, I think that Ray McNulty, who was the superintendent down in um, Wyndham Southeast and also up in Enosburg and Franklin, he used to say, you can have anything you want, you just can't have everything you want. And that's, I think that that is the place we are in right now, mm -hmm. um, collectively. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Did, are you, did I hear you suggest, you may not have, I could be way off base, that BOCES could potentially uh, replace supervisor unions? No, I didn't say that. Um, I read between some yeah. me. I mean, so the, there are probably some supervisory union superintendents who are watching my testimony right now. And they, they <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm kidding. Supervisory unions are not among the, Features of our delivery system, supervisory unions generally are less efficient because they've got a lot of boards yeah. with making a lot of decisions that are not necessarily consistent with one another. And I and I think that um, BOCES are it's a different animal of sorts because you're not concerning yourself with the governance of the entire. Uh, array of school districts, you're basically saying the school districts are going to govern themselves, but for these areas that we are specifically going after efficiency and effectiveness on, because because we see the benefit of collaboration, we're going to collaborate, and then we're going to put in the hands of both the board and professionals like a really focused pursuit so of those things. It's not a governance structure. No. It's a service entity. Got it. That, that's actually really helpful to say it that way. Service yeah. agency. Or entity. entity. Yeah. It's like, what can we collaborate on? It's like a co-op. It's, you know, it's, it's got the same sort of a principle of a, as a co-op, except it's not, it delivers services rather than goods. And we, so, well, just for clarity. Yeah. So, OCs versus, I call them super unions, but like a super or supervisory union. Right. Uh, you think that uh, your your um, recommendation is to do leave leave super uh, supervisory union unions alone, create OCs, let them do different one doing governance, the other doing service. maximizing efficiency on services. Is that kind of the approach? Yeah, I, 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 I was concentrating on you talking about super supervisory unions, and it, I, my brain almost disengaged at that point because I was because I was what I was what I was recollecting Act Forty Six. So one of the purposes of Act Forty Six was to see supervisory unions merged into school districts. 
and a lot of them did. Like, you know, I, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but we made tremendous progress in going from a supervisory union model to a school district model under Act 46. You then have a single governing book board, and you get to make decisions about how you're going to deploy the resources of that school district across the schools in that district. Um, so I, I, I'm i sorry, but I lost you there. What was the second half of your question? Well, where to put your efforts. Right. So uh, consolidating supervisory unions right. or BOCES. Right. Uh, and essentially have them serve two different functions. Right. But in parallel. Right. If there was a, if there was a notion that we were going to take existing school districts and put them into a newly formed supervisory union where you would have a multitude of school districts or more than one school district <coughs> with each with their own governing body and one central office superintendent and I'd say don't do that because I think that it complicates the governance picture and it complicates the life of the central office, which is now responsible for managing or overseeing not only two districts, but also two governing boards. So I wouldn't do that. I would I would rather see, and I think that, and I'm speaking for myself now, but I think the association would definitely stand behind it. If there was gonna be further consolidation, I would say continue the Act 46 approach of combining existing school districts into a single school district. And I'll speak specifically about that because it's been stated publicly in the conversations that the House Education Committee is having. Four years ago, the three superintendents in Addison County, so Addison Central, Addison Northeast, excuse me, Addison Northwest and, and Mount Aid School District, they had a meeting with Dan French and they said, we can see the trajectory of enrollment in Addison County, um, our schools are all shrinking. We think that there ought to be uh, an, a, a state um, directed initiative to combine those three districts into a single district. And it was in the post Act 46 era and a lot of blood was spilled uh, over Act 46. And the response came back that we don't see any political appetite to do that. My point is, you, you're going to get more efficient systems if you if you merge districts into a single district with one governing body than you would be to take any configuration of either existing school districts and supervisory unions and making bigger entities. But but the concept of a BOCES, if you had a larger supervisory union, couldn't they deal with both governance and services? I, I don't, yeah, I, well, I mean, I think that's a great question. It depends on where the voter comes in, right? So right now in Vermont, we, we maintain a, you know, it's a historic pattern of everybody votes on select board, school boards, and so on and so forth. That's, you know, what we are as our, our culture, our history. Um, BOCES, well, and and despite the history, <clears throat> the complexity of the system has only expanded in terms of special, you know, special program for kids, the, uh, the what you're trying to deploy educationally. So the, the BOCES response, and I think it probably has proven to be useful in other states, has been we're going to allow collaborations amongst or collaboratives among existing districts to make decisions about what types of services they need that they can gain efficiency through the services specifically, not necessary through governance. So I wouldn't dispute your, the theory. I just don't think that it's been commonly applied in any place. I think it's keep the districts as sort of their own um, historic political or municipal entity in place and then help them collaborate in terms of the kinds of services that they, as they evolve, are going to need. So I think the two, I, I, I appreciate and respect that point. I think the two concepts are different. So the old adage of widget, want it bad, get it bad. Okay. What was the first part of that? Widget, 
We want it bad. Yeah, yeah. We want something really bad. Well, then you get it really bad, meaning that it's not fully developed. So it's, it's half big. So we have Jim. So we have four weeks pushing hard. House did a great job. They set us up and they kind of teed up a nice fly ball. And we're trying to figure out, you know, where to catch it and where to where to throw the ball back. Um, so so with only four weeks left, yesterday there was a conversation about, well, is a study necessary? Right. This is complicated. Is a study the, a, a different approach? Same premise, same concept, same thoughts, all the, you know, the same people engaged. Is a study potentially the right way to go? Or should we finish this in four weeks and, and launch it? Your, your perspective. Yeah, I mean, it's my opinion. I, I, you know, I, I you don't have studies up on that shelf. You've got statutes. You could have studies. You could find you could load those shelves with studies that have amounted to nothing. Um, you know, I, I'm not trying to be cynical, but you could. I think that. Well, well, let me say this. I do not. I know you won't give me, nor do I want responsibility for you acting precipitously. Thanks for the testimony, Jeff. Now let's vote it out of committee. I don't want you to do that because I think your process is really, really good. The intent section and the example of function section on this bill is um, as well as I've, as good as I've seen in any bill I've ever read. I mean, it really goes to the point of what it is these BOCES can do. I think the better question in my mind is, what's the effect of passing this bill on a system that's under so much stress and pressure right now? Sure. And may change. Right. We know it's going to change. Right. But I don't think having the BOCES bill enabling legislation yeah. available for people to go get when you and they figure it out, because the need for specialized placements for students, for professional learning around things like literacy, for collaborating to utilize one person in a position that will serve eight school districts when those school districts might, and they would be inclined to do this, go get one of, try to go find one for one of those people, whoever it is for the district themselves. I think that that is additive in terms of the cost structure. So if our main theme right now is to get a handle on cost and efficiency, which, you know, it, it always is, but we all also contradict ourselves by saying, go do this too. I think that in terms of useful bills over time to support the delivery of the public education system in a more cost-effective manner, I think this has promise. Senator Williams, then we should probably, we have other witnesses. So, you know, it's, I think Senator. So I, I just want to make some comments. Yeah. First of all, you know, this may be a stopgap, but we got a problem. And I think eventually the problem is going to go away. You know, if we fix all the systems within the state of Vermont, the government, eventually people are all going to want to move. So our our diminishing student population could could be just a temporary thing. So that so as far as the uh you know, maybe as a stopgap or an interim fix, we got to start thinking about merging other schools and districts. But we don't have a plan. We don't. We need a vision for education in the state of Vermont. And BOCES, and I hate the term because that's so right, we'll the that. connotation yeah. is such a New York term. Yeah. But you know that's going to be a part. Of it. Yeah. And and I really appreciate your your sage advice and insight because you've been there for a yeah. long time. But you know, I think that we need to have a plan that says, okay, this is our situation right now. So how we're going to deal with it. But eventually, in, in any event, you do a decision support template, the education population starts to change, then we have a plan for it. We don't have a plan. You know, we're looking at a new uh, education secretary, potentially. Right. Right. So, well, no, that's a good point to planning. Yeah, please. What's the, uh, just out of curiosity, what's the issue with the term OCs. I've heard that a few times. I, I think it's too generic. It, you know, it needs to be more specific. What do we intended to do? You know, and, we yeah. can come up with any acronym. Yeah. In New York State and other right. states, it tends to be, it's catch-all for CGE students. Right. 
Right. And historically, it doesn't, people don't use it in a um, thoughtful way right. in other states. Maybe that's the Yeah, way. I mean, I, I haven't had that experience, but I believe you. Yeah. yeah. It's not a bad system in New York State, but we have a unique situation in Vermont, and whatever we call this, whatever we want this to be, should have its own, our own brand. Well, yeah. Okay. yeah. Am I switching out, Colin? Thank you. Go ahead and uh, you also the red screen over there. Okay. Do you want to name it? Yeah. Yeah. Is there something special about that? I, I was just invited. Oh, you're back. Jay tried to say, I'm going to run the thing. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, just too bad. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Go for it. Okay. Uh, thank you. For the record, Colin Robinson, Vermont NEA. And um, I appreciate the conversation yesterday, the conversation you just had with Jeff Francis. I'll keep my remarks relatively relatively brief. Um, so I wanted, for us organizationally, this wasn't something that we were familiar with until the bill emerged. Yeah. Um, but what was interesting, a year ago, we had an annual meeting of our members, and a year ago, our members passed a resolution um, saying, and it was specifically from special education teachers saying, we have so many students right now with significant needs, and we're not able to find places for them to get the support they need. We need to do something to address this challenge so we can support students, support their learning, and help um, them to integrate back into our schools as full learners and citizens. And as soon as I saw this bill, I was like, this is the opportunity to do that. Because as was mentioned earlier, you've seen some of these nascent um, collaborations between Essex Westford and South Burlington, but we're hearing it from members all across the state. And I think you've heard from various constituencies about this, this need in the moment, which I think is indicative of of all the needs across the system for districts to find ways to address complex challenges that they're all facing that they might not be able to address in the most impactful, most efficient, most effective way in their own school district or supervisory union. So that was our entry point, is about the kids and about how to make, most effectively meet their needs. I think, as Jeff said, the findings, I think, articulate the value of this and the value proposition of it, I think it also articulates uh, the vision. And I think some of the conversation you were just having about what is the vision for the future of our education system, I think it is one that is rooted in um, deep collaboration across communities, across SUs and SDs, about um, finding, cultivating that shared vision and mission across those geographic spaces, where, as you see in the map in front of you, there is a historic uh, connection, but informality, while important, doesn't always crystallize division, decision making, doesn't crystallize shared mission and vision for how to support our students. And I think that's the promise and, and hope of this. Um, I also think that, as was mentioned earlier, there are, you know, it also creates space for communities to elevate conversations beyond the students in their tech or the students in their district. To say, I actually want to make sure the students in the district uh, served by, you know, Wyndham Central are served as well as Wyndham Southeast, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, and the kids of Rumlin Town and Rumlin City are served just as well as each other. And I think it, by regionalizing some of the scope of how we support our students, it can um, hopefully also kind of reorient how we think about how we support it. Do you think it could do that? I, I mean, do. The only, I do. You know, I had so many. So I'm an eternal oh. optimist. So yeah, no, that's good. I, I hope you change. Well, I just thought 46 would, would get some of more of that to happen. And uh, so maybe this will. Maybe this will get people. You know, I can see where conversations can be had. Will be had around. Purchasing, but yeah, you could see then if, if questions of literacy, if questions of you know where is there a foreign language teacher pop up, yeah, I think it, yeah, you could see some of that stuff. Well, and here's another. It would be great. 
and as we stitch, yeah, yeah, and as we stitch all the conversations that are going on right now together, you can see how this can become a tool for effective discussion, implementation, and application of various issues. Case in point, the one I've thought about a lot beyond um, supporting uh, the students that I described earlier is school facilities and school construction, right? We, we've all read the report. We know we have significant needs. We know we have schools that are in various states of, um, of disrepair or need for um, sustainable futures. And at the same time, undertaking the process of building, studying, all the things that go into figuring out if you're going to build a new school or are you going to do it with newer and fewer or what that's going to look like, that requires an actual human or humans dedicated to that task to make sure that that project is done effective, efficiently, meeting, reflecting the students and community needs. And to me, that's also a perfect place for a BOCES, right? One district might not be able to hire that construction project manager for their, um, you know, one construction project, but maybe a BOCES hires that person in service of their member districts to help facilitate those complex operational decisions across several SUs or SDs, right? That's a really good example. It's really fascinating. Yeah, I'll be curious on Friday if some of those states had yeah. that kind of thing, but yeah. yeah, I think it's a real possibility for sure. So, um, and the final thing I just want to, um, so that's all. We think there's there's value here. We think there's opportunity. Um, nothing of grand substance to add to what Jeff Francis spoke to. I did just give the conversation yesterday around um, page 13 on the bill goes into issues related to employment, the pension systems, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I just want to flesh that out a little bit contextually for you all. Basically, what we're doing there is these BOCES are setting up the potential for a new public in, public school employer, and all that's doing is mapping current um, collective bargaining statute and pension statute to these new public school uh, employer constructs. So um, the organizing statute in there, what's kind of curious, a little factoid, um, Teachers who choose to get together and form a union do so under the teacher labor relations law. Um, and that would allow teachers, should they should they so choose to, to have that right. It doesn't compel anything, it doesn't require, but if teachers who work for BOCES want to, they could. Interestingly, also, if you're a school support staff member, an unlicensed professional in school districts, you're actually covered by the municipal labor relations law. So that's why it references municipal. So that maps it over for, say, you know, if there was a janitorial consortium that emerged across mm -hmm. a BOCES, you know, it would give those folks the ability, if they so chose to, chose to go through the normal processes through that. And it's the same thing with um, VISTERS, which is the Vermont Teacher um, Retirement System, and Beamers, which is the municipal system. The municipal system is the one for unlicensed school staff. And VISTERS, the teacher system, is for all licensed teachers, including superintendents, principals, et cetera, et cetera. So it's purely sort of conforming and kind of mapping those over. But I just wanted to sort of flesh that out yeah, um, thanks. more specifically for you all. Yep. So it sounds like it's fun. We did? Yeah. 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 So can I ask you some of the same questions, uh, so Jeff? Sure. Uh, BOCES versus uh, super units. You know, it's... Um, where where should the effort be applied if we're going to apply only one, we're going to pull only one lever? Yeah. I mean, complex systems are identification complex, complex and take, um, take a lot of time. And I think that's what Jeff was referring to, uh, time to sort of figure out what looks, what the future looks like. And I think that's what Jeff was referring to around the conversation with Act 56. I, I think that the, the potential with BOCES is to facilitate those regionalized conversations that perhaps at a future point in time lead to something like you're saying. I, given the history of Vermont's education system, given our deep commitment to our local public schools and citizen and community input in those, um, this is a 
very logical and impactful step to that might perhaps lead to that conversation or not. Um, I I don't. Again, going back to that 46 conversation, which we quite frankly weren't as deeply engaged in as the superintendent, school boards, or principals. Um, those conversations literally tore communities apart. Yeah. Um, and I I think that this creates a space where some trust can be built, where collaboration can be developed, and perhaps a vision for the future can emerge. Okay. So like uh, yeah, of course. Uh, for your second question. <laughs> Same as I asked Jeff, uh, study versus implementation. Study versus, like, yeah. you know, pause, study. Oh. I know I'm asking for opinion. Okay. From the end. Okay. So, study. pause versus, I mean, study, pause versus four weeks, pull lever, and launch. I think what's, what's ex exciting about this opportunity is just that it's an opportunity. It doesn't require anything. I think we have... Uh, you know, 41 other states that we know who have gone down this path. And I'm sure that some places have implemented it with incredible efficacy and other places, perhaps there's been more of an ebb and flow. At the end of the day, they exist in 41 other states because they, I presume, work, you know? Um, and so I think creating what passage of this bill will create the opportunity for that to move forward now. Um, I don't know that anything um, would necessarily, we would learn anything new from a study at this particular moment that would better inform the efficacy or opportunity or possibilities of this policy uh, that would change from now until, say, next January when it potentially pulled it under. Yeah, no, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, I was going to ask Jeff. You know. Right on top, right out of runway margin. Um, For the record, Jeff Francis. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. It's so, pretty, so Bosey's so so uh, responsibilities, tentative, theoretical Bosey's responsibilities versus AOE responsibilities. And then I'll just kind of like focus this on uh, logistics, you know, supplies, requisitions, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, do you have a thought on? Whether this should be a um, AOE responsibility versus a regional BOCES, is there any kind of any kind of feedback? And if I may, just because it's yeah. in the history, we did have a, a good conversation about should it be an arm of the agency, which, you know, the purchasing stuff. Sure, so you were here. Uh, you know, I mean, again, I'm not an expert in state government, but I believe that procurement for various things goes through building and general services. And so even within state government, there is a particular, you know, I don't think AOE is purchasing its own toilet paper, for example, I think it's probably going through BGS. Um, you know, the one thing that uh, gives me pause on kind of elevating up the AOE, and I think we saw this with, again, others can speak to this better than I can, SSDMS, the Shared Data Management System, um, there was a, a vendor that was selected by the AOE. It ended up not being a vendor that True. worked well, and it caused a whole story history of kerfuffles along the way. And so I think what is maintained with the BOCES structure is that local connectivity, even if it's a regionalized connectivity, that I think could get a little muddied if it were um, kind of brought up to the AOE. I think collaboration between the BOCES and AOE obviously should be should be deep and robust. Um, but I think when it comes to kind of the nimbleness and the nuance of needs, I think you're going to be able to be more responsive to that at the BOCES level. Okay. That it's, it's, okay. I totally agree. Senator Williams, final question. This is for you. For yeah. I'm thinking that, uh, you know, I like the bill. Yeah. Um, we set policy. Mm -hmm. We come and go every two years, potentially. Mm -hmm. So where is the continuity? You know, because I I'm, I'm going to use I'm going to use uh, Act One Twenty Seven as an example. Okay. You know, we are all dealing with something that we didn't even know was going to hit us. So if we employ, we put this implementation date out two years from now, who, where is the continuity to make sure that this doesn't die 
uh, in the dome? Yeah, it's a, <clears throat> it's a good question. <clears throat> I think having that data out, ledge council, others will sort of keep this committee, whatever its format is, uh, abreast. The Agency of Education will kind of will keep its eye on it as well. Yep. Superintendents associate all those groups will work to make sure that implementation is ready by 2028. Um, what if AOE doesn't like it? And so who's going to shepherd this thing through? Yeah, so what I would pass <clears throat> Good question. I think, <clears throat> excuse me, generally groups like Superintendent Association, groups that it will really impact, school board association, others will sort of be our important people to touch base with during the process. And I think without a doubt, whether AOE likes it or not, they're going to have to follow the letter of the law as well as respond to any concerns out there in the field if it's not being um, implemented. <clears throat> sure. Yeah, but no, that's a good question. It's it's always that sort of two years. What's what's going to happen? I think I'm the only one here that is here for life. But so uh, the rest of you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Appreciate Thank you all. Thank you for the questions. All, all set. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good afternoon. For the record, Jane is Executive Director of the Vermont Principals Association. I'll try to <clears throat> not hit on the things that were already done by Thanks. Uh, Jeff McCollum. Um, first of all, I'll say I think it's time that Vermont have a proper educational service agency. Uh, I did submit some written testimony, but I'm not going to follow that. I think it does make sense to be looking at that this time. I did want to say that in Section 2, there's some uh, comment about cost benefit analysis. I just want to say whatever process there is for that should be as simple as possible. So if there's testimony around that, I, I sometimes people see a bunch of red tape, especially there are least well resourced systems, and just say, oh, we don't have time to do this, we're too busy. So I want to make sure, make it as simple as possible for places like that to do that analysis. To do that analysis, yeah, yeah. yeah really simple. Yeah. Uh, and we like the idea of encouraging the Bolsey system and checking in a couple of years to see how well it's going, whether or not people are doing it, and then deciding, does it need to be expanded? Does mandating membership in some areas might be a possibility. Uh, Senator Williams mentioned about population concerns. And so in 1997, we had 126, 127,000 kids. And that's before we had pre-K kids in most of our buildings. And now we're around 84,000 kids if you count pre-K kids. So, and the trend line doesn't look good. We could, be, we could be in the high 60s, low 70s in another decade. So I'm much more worried. I, I would love to see us have a problem. Oh, what are you doing kids in there? It's, a, it's an issue. So what can we do systemically? And as Senator Campion talked about before, so that we're attracting families here and having people stay here. One of the number one things that attracts them is our really good schools, of course. Um, and along with that, of course, for the housing thing, is I hear it all the time. Here. Teachers that are turning down jobs <laughs> and trying to put some of them. So I just wanted to share that. With you. And it'll be interesting to see after, you know, whenever we can get our hand, heads around to a handle on it, is how many people we saw during the pandemic, exactly how many families, what folks are we seeing around climate. I think the bombs are globe. It's amazing what's happening along the coast of Massachusetts. Prices dropping, houses close to the water, people are heading to different states. So I. <clears throat> I never know. Yeah, I never know. I think that's Senator Williams' yeah, yeah. point. But, yeah, you know. and I know there's this group that I've been seeing this trend now for two and a half decades. Yeah, yeah. And the, you know the demographics don't look good. Yeah. You know, when you look at our demographics in Vermont, our 19 to 44 year old population is our smallest population, yeah. percentage-wise, in terms of its percentage. Really it's really interesting. That's, that's scary. Those are the ones that are making babies, and we need more of them. Uh, so I, I do have that concern. Um, I like Jeff Francis' comments about resources and equity at the system level. I do think we've done a pretty good job developing an educational funding model that is probably the most equitable in the nation. Uh, independent studies have shown that over and over again with Act 60 and Act 68 and the way that we try to fund uh, people for people spending. But we still have resource-wise, teacher, administrator, salary-wise, major differences from community to community. Uh, and our ability to provide resources for some kids and some communities <laughs> still has a long ways to go. So as a whole, in mind that with a voluntary system like Bolsey's, I totally agree, by the way, with a 
Yeah, I was featured in Albert. What was the first part? Yeah, what was the first part you said? What was just cooperative education? Yes, yeah. Something like that, yeah. Uh, yes. or entity yes. or whatever. Yeah, you gotta make sure it's you gotta make sure it's incorporated to the center. Um, and I want to give you an example. So I was thinking about when I was a superintendent of Grand County. Um, a model like this could really provide economy of scale and work at a county level with three or four superintendent sharing services. And what I what I started thinking about was when I left there seven years ago, it was just where we started to really have the issues where kids that used to have like Workers come in from like, in, in Chittenden County, be the Howard Center. Uh, but in Franklin County, it was Franklin County Mental Health. They would have people come in and provide extra support for these kids that needed it. Those kids now, uh, we have kids that are so much more in need than those kids over then. And schools are experiencing this all the time. And yeah, we have no place to sit in Mount Center. So if you, if you get together some superintendents and some school boards and decide, that, you know, we could almost build our own school, our own program. Yeah using the existing building to service 20, 30, 40 students. And I'm just using Franklin County, for example. In our system, as opposed to trying to send kids out, there's probably an economy to scale that you can save. The local school district of Berkshire can't do that. The local school district of Berkshire is not going to do that. But if you put all these county, all these schools in the county together, that could happen. It also made me think, you know, if you were a teacher then, but we had a thing called Rink, uh, uh, Daniel Bank in the Rink in Essex. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Well, that was an example of where districts got together, Essex set it up, a special was going to pay money to it, and brought in a national speaker, Daniel Bank, was one of my favorite speakers, and he talked about education and innovation and things like that. We could do that for things like reading. You know, we could have groups get together and say, okay, what's the best training we want to really provide for our K3 teachers? Yeah. Let's get all the three K3 teachers in this whole center, and let's provide high quality professional learning for all the K3 teachers in reading instruction, and let's do it together and partner. And I think there's ways that there's benefits on these scale to do. Uh, a couple more thoughts. I agree I'm moving the dates back, uh, effective dates, corresponding dates related to that. And uh, I really want to question what Colin said. I had a thought much about the points that Colin made regarding retirement pensions and protecting employee rights. The VBA fully supports the categories of employees that may have moved or may move from the school district to the OCs and wants those employees' employment rights to be protected. One of the areas that there was, there was some pushback in, in Act 26 in some places where some people use that as an opportunity to potentially say, now that you're becoming a new district, teachers might be losing some rights, and there's lot, lots of anger and moral sense. We shouldn't go down that road, that road again. And then lastly, a supervisor union did approve true. What? And we're years behind that. Did approve true. Well, where we, where I was working, we were able to essentially we came up with a new master agreement and all teachers were all out of this. Um, but that, I don't know if that's true everywhere. You know, we were right. closely with our union to make sure that that was the case. No, I didn't think so. I know there were some places where a lot of people felt like they were lost seniority or, or jobs. And that, that shouldn't happen. Uh, we have 800 to 1,000 teachers on provisional licenses. So the teachers are already experienced enough training. We don't want to be losing those folks over, over things like that that are not appropriate. And to your question about supervisor unions, uh, I'm a big believer in the Constitution of the United States. I'm not a big believer in the Articles of the Confederation. And to me, that's the difference. But the supervisor union is like the Articles of the Confederation. Uh, you can all participate kind of if you want to, but it doesn't really have a lot of authority, whereas the school district does have authority. Where a supervisor union makes sense, and the reason Vermont went to that model, I don't know when they went to it, 1930s or whatever, was because as transportation came into being, they, they realized some of these services that need to be provided, our schools are too small to provide. So let's have a supervisor union, not well, one superintendent will not oversee it, they'll take care of negotiations, eventually they decide we'll have a business manager that will help develop budgets for each of the school districts because we don't have the expertise in every school. And that's gone throughout history, and we're uh, with a law change. I think it's Act 153, where special educators uh, became district employees, and parents became district employees, and a lot of that was all around scale. Um, and that's that's what supervisor needs to do. Bolsey like. It is Bolsey like. It is Bolsey like. Here's the difference. In Bolsey's, I don't have Act 153 in the following. We are agreeing to articles of agreement. Our three supervisor meetings, three of us are joining together, and we're setting up 
these three areas that we're going to work together. We've decided it's going to be literacy, K-3 teacher training. It's going to be uh, special education accommodations for students of certain diagnosis that would otherwise be sent out of the state. And it's going to be professional learning for more learning for teachers. So I'm just picking this up. And then we do members of agreement. We have a board member for each of our boards. And somebody oversees us. And we share our resources. And we hire those employees that are going to do that. And they are employees of our new entity. And that's essentially what it would look like from my, from my perspective. Does that make any more clear? That whole thing? I'm not going to be actually more annual than actually superintendent for a lot of years. But not either. He's asking. So, <laughs> so, so, so I said to the two gentlemen, um, both the super union or a larger supervisory union. You know, what, what's what's the uh, what's your thought on the, the, the appropriate approach? I, I personally am not a fan of supervisory unions. Period. And I'm definitely not a fan of larger supervisory. Okay. So I would rather have supervisory districts with one board. The district in 2005 or six, just in the room, we as a superintendent have had a position paper that said we think that it's the best strategy to take all the supervisory unions in the state and make them single districts. And what was the legislation now? 83? You're going to be throwing Peter Powell's and Joey Donovan and stuff and all of us and came up with a compromise, which was 83, which didn't make it all the way through, but eventually kind of led to Act 46. And Act 46 was basically, in my perspective, a compromise But it's not much even at the end. I always yeah. have you pegged as a capitalist. I know, right? <laughs> that was the first time. Thank you very much. Well, Ms. Zimmerman, I don't, don't want to cut you short. short. Do you think you can? Uh, oh, I definitely Five minutes-ish? Oh, I, I, I think I can do it. In the future, we will absolutely yeah. have you first. It's not work. Just remind me. Perfect. What's that? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. A little bit. <laughs> yeah. All right, here's the Marin yes, School Board Association. I have testimony. Yes. A lot has been said. Um, it was hard writing testimony because I knew this conversation would evolve. From our school board's perspective, I think there's adequate oversight baked into the bill through audits, annual reports, quarterly reports, potential representation or the ability to designate appropriate representation on the board. So we're fine with that. Timelines, quite honestly, from like a school board's perspective, the heavy lift is going to be, as Jeff had noted, it's going to be on the administration. Um, you know, I just think in terms of like kind of operationalizing this, the superintendent's going to have to work with the board chair to come up with a plan. It won't be too dissimilar, probably, from like an Act 46 and sort of those exploratory conversations. There's going to have to be special meetings. There's going to have to be, I mean, everything that a school board does to consider this is going to have to happen in open meeting, right? Mm -hmm. So there's going to have it's going to have to be baked into the annual meeting. There will be some special meetings on this. So um, the timeline will be what the timeline will be from our perspective, but if we have the administrative arm saying timeline should probably be pushed out, I, I think that's fine too. So that's what I have to say on that. So yeah, we are in support of the bill. And I would say like, I kind of come through our resolutions because we've explained to you before, our resolutions serve as a foundation for all of our work here and our members want to ensure equitable access for our students and achieve cost effectiveness and mm -hmm. goals, so. Yes, yeah. Did Senator Lee want to go? No? Okay. Thanks. Um, Question for all four of you, not to answer right now, but you can ruminate on this uh, a little bit. Mr. Francis likes to talk about the additive work that we do here, which is absolutely right. If we are to implement this, um, what is what, if anything, is there that we might be able to take away that could be helpful? And it doesn't mean answer right now, but this is something that I was thinking about, just to simplify. Make it right easier. Okay. Senator Weeks. Yeah, I did, uh, if I could, thank you, Kara. Uh, I actually want to go back to a comment that Jay made in regards to his words, uh, mandate. And I'm wondering what your thoughts were there and why you, you know, what, 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 what are your thoughts were? The only thing I was saying is that a lot of times we, again, Jay, I'm close to the record. Uh, Vermont Principals Association. A lot of times we 
put a floor five years that don't ever uh, mouth anything because nobody takes advantage of that. And it's just something I think that we need to be thinking about as we move forward. And I'm not saying necessarily it needs to be the old season model or an SD, but at some time, some point, some people are going to make some higher decisions in the city about what's the right size for a school, what's the right size for a district or a system, uh, what's the right size for the number of students that we should have in the class, and what steps do we need to take to, to the right size given the number of students that we have. And I think that's going to come down to uh, nobody wants to close their own local school and nobody wants to make those tough decisions in their own communities. I think at some point, the General Assembly is going to get the pleasure of trying to make those tough decisions. Yeah. Yeah, can I disagree with what um, Mr. Nichols is saying? I think sometimes when we need these conversations to communities, they can really tear people and, and neighborhoods apart. I think they get very contentious, very personal. We all know when it comes to talking about your own kids, you're just not in a space to be very dispassionate and logical. So uh, there's that piece of it. I also think, to your point, uh, we have to make some hard decisions. And I know people want to get reelected so they don't want to antagonize their voters. And yet, that's where the hard work is, and that's that. I couldn't agree with you more. I think people are going to have to have courage going moving forward. And some, you know, I can't imagine a legislature ever say, having to debate for hours on school size or seeking a classroom. I don't see that kind of thing happening. I mean, it's sort of, you know, maybe, but um, tricky. And I'm not talking about anger of people. I'm talking about the research that's out there and what is the role and the responsibility of the legislature in terms of class size, given we don't want an industrialized education. We want to have, we have a range of kids that have a range of sort of needs and are going to fit it into different spots. I mean, maybe someday we'll see, hey, all classes have to be a certain size, or this is, you know, but yeah, it'll be interesting. Senator Williams. And I just want to make a comment that uh, kind of what Jay said, I don't want like to do a big bike today. That's not where I came from. But uh, you know, as long as people are being taxed and having to pay for property taxes, 18 and a half percent of this wants to stay in the education system, they're going to have a say. And until we come up with a different way of funding education, we're going to, we're going to, we're not going to get a lot of say. So, so that we'll see. Mrs. Zimmerman, any final thoughts on this? Yeah. Okay, okay, we're going to, we're going to take 10 minutes and we'll come back and jump into school construction. Thank you all very much. Yeah. Morgan, you want to take us off? Welcome back to Senate Education. Yeah, There's a little we'll juice in here. First, uh, Representative Conlin, uh, H871, uh, this is an act relating to development of an updated state aid to school construction program. The floor is yours. If you can Thank give you us a much. little overview yeah. and then we're going to switch to Ledge Council. Uh, Representative Peter Conlon, Chair of the House Education Committee. Uh, H871 basically continues the work uh, that the last task force iteration did um, and also sort of gets things going to lay the groundwork for a program. Uh, so just a little bit of background on the task force, this last go around, it basically got a late start during the flooding, the obligations of the treasurer's office, obligations of the AOE, and it, it would end up really being a bit of an unwieldy committee in order to find sufficient amount of time to meet for long periods to take on big topics. So it did, it did not produce Let's call it a fully baked proposal on school construction with legislature. And it's also, frankly, pretty complicated uh, thing to do. But so just to go through the bill quickly, um, it starts off uh, to have the AOE put together and create a um, facilities master plan grant program. One of the things the task force of 2023 thought about was eligibility to qualify for state aid and that really we want every school district to do a thoughtful plan of their future based on needs, demographics, school building condition, and, and all of that. But understanding that a, a true facilities master plan is expensive, yeah. it could really be a burden for a lot of school districts. I was chair of our school district when we went through one, I think we spent $230,000. Yeah. That includes robust public engagement, 
That's what I'm saying. So anyway, part of this is there's no money attached, but it's to get the facilities master grant program set up, organized. Uh, a, we would take that on. They are uh, fully on board. They want to make it as sort of transparent, plug and play as possible, where it's like everything's on a number, very little, you know, no narrative, that sort of thing. But so every district would have an understanding of how they would qualify um, and would they qualify. When we've been talking with the chair of approach here, one of the things that we're going to be pushing for are certain positions in AOE. Does AOE have a construction, uh, somebody who is designated, would you remind me, or a team? You no, know, they have one person. They have one person. Yeah, Bob, uh, 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 his last name is Steve, even though he lives four doors down from me. Uh, Bob Johnson, I think it is. But anyway, it's Richard. Richard. No. Donahue. Well, Donahue. Donahue. Yeah. Donahue. Yeah. Donahue. Sorry about that. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Very embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> and, but, you know, he has a lot going on yeah. uh, right now. But in terms of setting this up, he and the director of operations, um, Jill Briggs Campbell, uh, have said, we can make this work, we can make this happen. So there's no additional position in the House Pass big bill that has anything, no additional position for this. Correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, however, that then falls to the work of part two of the bill, which is really to create a legislative task force of six, three from the House, three from the Senate, one member of uh, the, the Secretary of Education or designee mm -hmm. to essentially operate as one of our committees, take testimony, and just start making the hard decisions so that at the end of their work, legislative language, not a report, will be presented. And, and this lays out, it's everyone really kind of lays out the issues for them to wrestle with, you know, at a, things like, okay, uh, you know, let's say we have a funding program and um, it works similar to Rhode Island. Uh, are we going to provide incentives and bonuses for, and, and what should they be? And what is going to be um, top priority? Is it newer and fewer, or is it health and safety, or is it energy efficiency uh, and at what level? The, you know, the, the funding, the overall big bonding scheme is, is you know, Pretty well kind of laid out, needs some polish, but uh, the, the task force looked at the Rhode Island model, especially the, um, the uh, treasurer's office modeled it. And, you know, in order to have the state's bonding capacity absorb what's called a fraction of the level of need, but it's still a high level, um, there is a methodology which uh, let's say $10 million of dedicated revenue could create a half a billion dollars in bonding capacity for the state. Uh, and that's based on a program where the state doesn't just hand you 30% for your project total. It pays, it, it contributes 30% to your annual costs of the bond. Uh, so that's why it needs an ongoing payment plan. So anyway, the, the other half of this bill is really about that group and its work to come back to the legislature with those hard decisions, as well as JFO uh, modeling uh, revenue options to fund that, as well as sort of saying, okay, what do we want to go for? Uh, that's it's sort of walking through all that uh, item by item. Can you ask you a question? <laughs> yeah. Go. So, sorry. Yeah, go. It, is the treasurer invoked in this no. bill at all? Okay. No, it's really meant to be a committee this size. Um, just taking testimony, making the decisions, and moving forward. So there's a product at the end. Right? Because you know, I think we we sort of know all the issues, and now it's, it's really the decision making that has to happen. Great. We're gonna have to wait till after the election. I know, but yeah. <laughs> Why? Well, effective in July. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Representative Uh So really, uh, it's. You know, it, so it lays out the uh, the duties of the, of the task force. Um, it, it talked very briefly about uh, the agency of education and buildings and general services um, doing uh, some work together on a list of approved contractors, that, let's say engineers and architects to do the work. Um, again, the decisions that we made on the, by the task force. Uh, you know, one of the things that the that this new group would need to come up with is what's the governing body of this. 
So a lot of other states have a completely separate department, commission, whatever, of paid staff people who do this work. They, they're on the ground helping schools come up with their best proposals. They're evaluating proposals, making decisions on who qualifies for what, using formula, and then awarding the dollars. Uh, do you and, think we should move in that direction? Well, the, yeah, I think that, that there's a lot of support for the idea that it be an independent body yeah. outside of the AOE, not not having to share staff with the AOE so it could be dedicated to Yeah, that. no, the only reason I ask is it could be something that we, if you think it's heading our, if we're heading in that direction, I'm sure the Appropriations Committee could help us prepare for heading in that direction, finally, uh, in terms of putting money aside. Yeah, I mean, I think that that, uh, that would be great. It could also be funded through whatever dedicated revenue stream can define. So let's just say the sports betting and sports mm -hmm. betting generating $15 million a year. We said that revenue is to be used for school construction. That could also co cover the cost of a center board. Mm -hmm. Or seats. One word, both seats. That's yeah. it. Okay. Right. or something. I mean, this, yeah. you know, the, the yes. level of, yes. this requires a level of expertise, statewide level of expertise. Yeah. If, if the goal is to help schools come up yeah. with successful processes and, and proposals, it needs Great. strong expertise at the state level helping them out. Um, so that is really the general overview and uh, Ledge Council will have the details for you if you go through the bill line, by the way. But I'll stick around for them. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, you guys are done? I think I'm done. Go ahead. So your committee's done? Yes. Oh, great. Great. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Switch. Doing this. You guys off the floor, too? Is the yeah. said pass? Is the said pass? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. We're touching a little bit of that later today, too. Chris, this one section. Ms. St. James. <laughs> Good afternoon, Beth St. James, Office of Legislative Council. We are going to walk through H871 as passed by the House. Um, how are we on time? You know, I'd love to be able to do it in about 20 minutes. Okay. Do you think that's possible or no? Yes. No. Okay. Well, we can go a little depends on your question. If we don't yeah. ask questions, definitely. Uh, well, you know what we're transitioning right into after yeah. is your time with us. So we have really 30 minutes. So, yeah. Okay. So section one of the bill um, is creating the facilities master plan grant program. And just to orient you, this is actually section one is actually proposing to flunk the master plan grant program into title 16. Um, and then you'll see that there's a repeal sunset um, that would take it out of title 16 when it's no longer useful. Um, but session law is always hard to find. <laughs> and um, the the sunset is in five years. So if folks are going to be relying on this legislation for several years, let's put it in Title 16. So the intent of the grant, the master plan grant program, um, there's some legislative intent here, and that is that the, the grant program will enable supervisory unions and independent career and technical education districts to develop a supervisory union level vision for all school buildings that meets the educational needs and goals of the supervisory union. So I think that's an important framework to have is that the grant program is gonna be on the SU level, not district by district. The goal of a facility master plan shall be to facilitate an evaluation of the capacity of existing facilities to deliver on identified 21st century educational goals. And it will also enable and require SUs to engage in intentional and robust conversations with the larger community that will hopefully lead to successful passage of bonds needed to support the renovation or construction needs of the SU. It is the intent of the General Assembly that awards shall be granted in accordance with this section and in a manner that allows a maximum number of SUs, independent career and technical education districts to successfully complete facilities master plans. So this intent language is important for several reasons. It is your intent, right? It's the General Assembly's intent. 
But the grant program, as we go up to page two, you'll see is um, administered by AOE, and there is a lot of discretion here. So we're this the intent section is giving AOE some parameters um, within which to administer the program. So we're on page two. We're going to start off. Yeah, please. Got. I have a question. Um, so this uh, uh, page one, line thirteen. Twenty first century educational goals. Who sets these goals? Is that a vision? So that is not a defined term. I believe it is a term that the education community uses quite often. Mm -hmm. um, and I would not be the best person to speak to that, but I believe it is a term of art that my guess is everyone sitting behind me uses. But I think we should pull it apart, really, like that, and really have a conversation to give some clarity to it. So on um, page two, line one, we're going to start with the definition section. So anytime you see the word supervisory union, it also means supervisory districts and independent career and technical education districts. So we don't have to repeat all three of those terms throughout the whole um, section. So subsection C, this is establishing a grant program. There is established the facilities master plan grant program to be administered by AOE from funds appropriated for this purpose to SUs and independent career and technical education districts to support the development of educational facilities master plans. Grant funds may be used to hire a consultant to assist in the development of the master plan with the goal of developing a final master plan that complies with state construction aid requirements. Subsection D is how are, how are those funds dispersed? So the agency shall develop standards for the disbursement of grant funds in accordance with the following. They shall, grants shall be awarded to applicants with the highest facilities needs. The agency shall develop a prioritization formula based on an applicant's poverty factor. That is, that is not defined here. We're going to leave it up to AOE to, to determine what the poverty factor is. And an average, the average facility condition index score. The average facility condition index score AOE already has, and that is a result of the Act 72 and the um, inventory that was done on, on all of the school buildings in the state. The agency shall develop or choose a poverty metric to use. Um, the agency may give priority to applicants with a regionalization focus that consists of more than one supervisory union um, that apply as a consortium. We're on page three now. Award amount are going to be issued commensurate with the gross square footage of buildings located in the applicant's um, SU. And the agency shall develop minimum requirements for what an educational facilities master plan has to include. And at a minimum, the agency's requirements need to include the following elements. A description of the educational mission, vision, and goals of the SU. A description of the educational programs and services offered by the SU. The performance of a space utilization assessment, the identification of new program needs, the development of enrollment projections, the performance of a facilities assessment beyond what was done through Act 72, and information regarding the various design options explored to address the SU's identified needs. So, Ms. St. James, in your opinion, is there something in here that would allow the agency to say, listen, the needs are too great? The needs are so great that, and there's a school 700 feet to seven miles away, and this is where that all those students should go. Is there that kind of? No. This is just a grant program mm -hmm. for SUs to develop their master plan for any future construction, building maintenance, et cetera. That master plan may take the concepts that you are talking about as far as consolidation into account. Okay. And you'll see what the and you'll see that that is a concept that is addressed um, in the task force is something that the task force for the working group needs to look at. Just curious from uh, Senator Collin if that particular issue was addressed in your committee during your deliberation. Uh, yes, I, I, I probably would respond just the same way uh, Mr. James did in that 
that is part of the charge of the task force. This is really just about the facilities master plan. And it could be that an SU puts together a facilities master plan, and part of that is these, this, these facilities aren't even worth putting a dime into. Yeah. Okay, please continue. Um, and then uh, AOE is required um, to report back to you all on or before December 31st annually while the program is up and running um, on the implementation of the grant program. So how's, how's the grant program running? And then section two is that sunset. So the vision is that the grant program will run for five years. So a repeal on June 30th, 2029. Okay. Um, continue in that. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. You have a question? What this could be for Mr. Conlon. I almost said Professor Conlon and or you, um, Beth, but why the sunset on in 2029? Um, I'll, I think maybe you should speak to that if it goes into the intent or. Uh, well, I think the, I would say two reasons. One, I think it was my impression that that's sort of good government policy is that you should revisit something rather than have it be ongoing, uh, which I think it probably be set up. And then number two is that the idea was, is, you know, get everybody on board doing facilities master plans sooner rather than later. Okay. So if there's a deadline to it, folks will get on board. Okay, thanks. I'm on the board, section three, requires AOE and DGS to work together to um, develop pre-qualification criteria for architecture and engineering firms specializing in K through 12 school design and construction, and then um, maintain that list to make that list available. Section four is the working group. This is the bulk of the bill. So this is a legislative working group composed of three members of the house, three members of the Senate and the Secretary of Education or designee. The working group, I'm on page five, line four, powers and duties. The working group shall study and create a recommended plan for a statewide school construction aid program, including recommendations on implementation. To facilitate its understanding of school construction, uh, projects and other state aid programs, they make the working group make conduct site visits. And in creating its recommendations, the working group shall address the following topics, and we're going to walk through those topics. Um, building upon the recommendations contained in the task force report from this past summer. Um, and are you all familiar with the status of the state aid to school construction program now? Being very puzzled look. Well, is, isn't there a moratorium? Yes. So there are laws on the books. There is a whole chapter in Title 16 about state aid to school construction, and it has been paused since 2007. Um, so you'll, I just wanted to, we're starting from scratch here, the working group. So these are the topics that the working group has to consider, and I will just spoil it all for you. There is a catch-all at the very end that says, anything else I have not, Beth St. James has not talked about, they still get to consider, okay? Um, so the first topic is governance. As Rep. Conlon, Conlon um, uh, indicated, different states do things differently. The working group is charged with recommending what the governance model for Vermont should look like, including recommendations on staffing level and a stable appropriation for the funding of the recommended governance structure. Page six, prioritization criteria. Um, how do we figure out where the money should go? The working group has to make recommendations on state aid prioritization criteria that will drive funding towards projects that are aligned with the state's educational policies and priorities. Eligibility criteria, who's even eligible for state aid school construction. So the working group has to consider at a minimum the following eligibility criteria. Appropriate maintenance and operations budgeting at the SU union level a requirement for eligible SUs to have a five-year capital plan, a facility condition index maximum level that would preclude eligibility, 
but may qualify a building for a state share percentage bonus to replace the building. And we'll talk about state shares later. A requirement for an SU master planning process that would require consideration of the adaptive reuse of schools for housing or other social infrastructures. And a prohibition on exclusionary zoning regulations that would preclude lesser resourced families from living in the applicable school district. State base share. The working group has to make a recommendation as to whether a state based share is appropriate, and if so, um, uh, whether it should be based on student or community poverty factors. So the concept of a state based share, please correct me if I get this wrong, is does everyone get 10 grand right off the bat? Doesn't matter if you meet any of the other eligibility criteria. Um, is there just a base share that the, the state um, uh, gives to you? Did I get that right? Did I get that? Um, and then the working group is also tasked with considering other factors such as local taxing capacity, student poverty data, environmental justice metrics, and energy burden metrics. Page seven, incentives. The working group shall consider the use of incentives or state share bonuses that align with Vermont's educational priorities with the goal of efficient and sustainable use of taxpayer supported school construction aid to improve student learning environments and opportunities. So the incentives that they have to include um, are school safety and security, health, educational enhancements, overcrowding solutions, and environmental performance, newer and fewer buildings, major renovations to improve the system's educational alignment and capacity, replacement of facilities with a current facility condition index of 65% or higher in combination with other policy area incentives, and schools identified with actionable levels of airborne PCBs and other identified environmental hazards and critical education spaces. Page eight. Some of these are set up as the working group shall consider, and some of them are, you have to make recommendations, but you don't get to consider whether to include this topic. And this is one of those, you don't get to consider whether to include that topic, assurance and certification process. So the working group has to make recommendations for an assurance and certification process. Um, uh, and at a minimum, that process should consider a district's commitment to adequate funding for ongoing maintenance and operations of any state-funded improvements, a district to assure adequate training for facilities and custodial staff to properly operate and maintain systems funded through state aid. A district to complete a full commissioning process as a requirement to receive state funds at the end of the project and a clerk of the works throughout the lifespan of the project. What is a clerk of the works? I don't think I've heard that. I think it's like a, a project so, manager. Yeah, yeah. So just okay. wanted to check. Thank you. That could be someone at a BOCES. Just saying. Um, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, the working group shall also consider whether the assurance and certification process shall be eligible for state funding support, as well as whether a preferred vendor list for the commissioning process is clerk for work specifically. I am on the very bottom of page eight, line 19, environmental hazards and contaminants. The working group shall make recommendations that approach environmental hazards and contaminants in a comprehensive manner, incorporating existing programs into the school construction aid program where possible. Pre-program construction aid. The working group shall consider whether and to what extent state aid should be made available to school districts that begin construction prior to the establishment or renewal of a state school construction program. So if you all enact a bill next year, it doesn't take effect until July 1, 2027. If a school district starts a construction project on July 1, 2026, is that school district eligible for those 2026 costs uh, prior to the, the state aid uh, going live? I'm on page nine, line seven, current law. The working group shall review state statutes and state board of education rules that concern or impact school construction and make recommendations to the General Assembly for amendments necessary to align with the working group's proposed construction aid program. So there's already current, there's already current laws on the books. So let's look at those. We just repeal them all from scratch. Is there some useful things? But also what this section 
sweeps in is literally any other state law that could touch on a school construction aid project. Senator Williams. Was there any consideration given to uh, net carbon zero status or I know they do that for industry. So the next chapter is a few of these. Um, but I would say in the current category here, when I say literally every state law, if there is a state law out there about new building and efficiencies, mm -hmm. the working group should be looking at that and seeing how that fits into the state aid for school construction aid program, Act 250. Environmental, the environmental justice bill. Mm -hmm. um, uh, historic preservation mm -hmm. laws. So all, all of these would have, fire all, and safety. All of these apply to these the buildings. Yep. Okay. How do they factor into this program? Yeah. Please. I, I assume that uh, so going back to page eight, line one. I assume that in the House committee that. Um, the whole the con the potential conflict between continuing PCB ex uh, testing and not, uh, that, that this, in this bill, that uh, line one being that this incentives apply to those schools that have identified PCBs. Must have been a bit of a conflict, must have been a bit of a conversation on whether they continue or pause, because this is clearly an incentive to those that we have tested and found to. Uh, so I would answer by saying um, we felt it was something that the task force should at, at, at least look at, um, you know, especially if you are a school that is under the four year EPA time frame and you're ready to go ahead with a project, should that get a higher incentive? It's just something to consider. You know, it's it basically for the, affecting those schools where it, it, it you know, they're a done deal. They've already been tested. They've already been found to have uh, above the school action level. Senator Connor, is, was there any conversation, and perhaps I missed it, about, you know, one of the things we've talked about on this committee are buildings that aren't PCBs that could be sometimes appropriate uh, for schools. I mean, we know there are a lot of buildings out there that wouldn't be appropriate, but there may be buildings that, gosh, it is a good fit and it. You know, people are transitioning out of it. Anything like that? Oh. Well, sorry, did you say right. buildings that were schools or that could become could schools? become schools? Uh, I think there's something in here about looking at new construction, but I, I would say that now, that concept did not okay. probably cross our minds that there are buildings out there that could be schools that currently aren't. That just brings up flashes of. Department stores that are now in high school. I know. No, I, I know. There are also some incredible historic buildings. I'm thinking in my community that, frankly, yeah, who knows? You know, and they should be at least considered, perhaps. And then, of course, there are some buildings in my community that were schools, you know, that aren't schools, and people are sort of repurposing some of those as well. It does speak to that. To that, okay. Yeah. Senator Weeks. No, no, okay. I'm fully on board. Okay, uh, please. Um, we are on page nine, line 12, efficiencies. The working group shall identify areas where economizations or efficiencies might be gained in the creation of the program, including pre-qualification of consultants in this area and cost containment strategies, such as um, the use of building templates for new construction. Some states literally have like a catalog where you get to pick from your building template. Yeah, yeah. Um, page 10, Fiscal modeling, the working group shall align the proposed construction aid program with fiscal modeling produced by JFO. School construction planning guide. This is a, um, I believe this is a, a document uh, put out by the agency um, and it exists because we had a state aid school construction program. So the working group is tasked with looking at that and making recommendations for an amendment necessary to align with working group's proposed construction aid program. Here's the catch all. Working group may consider any other topic, factor, or issue that it deems relevant to its work and recommendations. And then subsection N was added um, uh, through an amendment, um, which is why the additional considerations was not the last, and that really bothers, really bothers me. Um, population considerations. The working group shall consider and make recommendations as to whether, and if so, how, 
the unique needs of different populations shall be taken into account in developing the program, including the following population. Elementary students, high school students, SUs with low population density, and any other population the working group deems relevant to its work and recommendations. So that is, those are all of the things that the working group has to consider and make yeah. recommendations on. Page 11. Can I just ask one, again, again for uh, Representative Collins. So in that section, page 10 at the bottom, we're talking about population considerations. It's all about students, but I'm wondering if there was any thought about uh, where these administrative units go, like where their, where their buildings are. You know, typically they're all, they're kind of like on the side of a high school or what have you. Is that ever a consideration that if we, as we, as we, Create this plan that uh, that that their how that their office space also needs to be considered as a population. Uh, so not specifically. However, I think when you ask a supervisory name to do a facilities master plan, hopefully they are the ones taking that into account. Thank you. It is the bill is passed with the intent that the building will be used as a supervisory union level vision. So I do think that, that would sweep in supervisory union offices as having to be taken. Yeah, I'm just, account. it's not subdivided as a, a population. population. No. I think it should be. In, in this case, well, population, yes, I, 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 I definitely hear what you're saying. I think population, you were like, okay, should we have a stronger incentives for um, uh, something that is uh, perhaps combining three high schools into one mm -hmm. in terms of population? I think That's perhaps right. demographic may have been a better choice of word. I wrote this, so I can criticize that. <laughs> uh, uh, so we're going to go on page 11, subdivision 2, line 1. This lists entities that the working group has to consult in developing its plan. So usually when you see a working group or a task force, you just assume that they are going to take testimony from anyone they deem relevant to their um, work. Um, we are going to make the same assumptions about this working group, but we're going to also box them into hearing from these specific folks. AOE, Agency of Natural Resources, Department of Public Safety Division of Fire Safety, Natural Resources Board, Agency of Commerce and Community Development, the Division for Historic Preservation, U.S. Department of Education, U.S. Department of Agriculture and Rural Development, School Boards Association, the Superintendents Association, and anyone else. Senator Shane. Have all of, actually this question might be for Representative Collins as well, but have all of these agencies or departments expressed that they want to provide input, or have, have they taken a neutral stance? Have they no, they have not, and, and there are sort of reasons behind each one as to why our committee felt that they should be consulted. So, uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture and Rural Development. Well, they actually have federal funding available for mm -hmm. schools. When New School, for example, got a fair amount of money from them. Um, Natural Resources Board, uh, should we be uh, looking at schools not built in flood zones? Um, right? Look at Montpelier High School, you know, it's, if you were replacing that, you can build it right there in the flood zone. So each of these sort of have something that, that, we, that we felt should be touched on, but not necessarily an in-depth, like they need to come up with their proposal for the committee. Thank you. Okay. Um, and that dovetails nicely with the next one, the next subsection assistance. The working group, because this is a legislative working group, um, is going to have the administrative, technical, and legal assistance of the Office of Legislative Counsel, the Joint Fiscal Office, and the Office of Legislative Operations. Um, I am not an expert in Act 250. I am not an expert in historic preservation. I am not an expert. So, right? So, you yeah. want all of those agencies to be able to help you. Um, and then the working group on page, uh, the very bottom of page 11, um, is the charge with um, submitting its findings and recommendations in the form of proposed legislation. So no reforms. Page 12, Office of Council, Council called the first working group to occur on August 1st. 
of this. The working group has to select co-chairs from the among the members. Co-chairs from among the members. A majority of the members shall call the majority of them, and the working group shall cease to exist on December 31st. Cease to exist on December 31st, 2020. Working group gets per diem. And then section five is the appropriation. So there is fifteen thousand dollars appropriated. General dollars appropriated. Fiscal year twenty twenty five for the purpose of funding travel by the working group and per diem and reimbursement. And the per diem and reimbursement. And then the bill would take effect on July one twenty twenty four. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Uh, so, I was wondering on page seven. Uh, it's definitely a good, good uh, follow on um, from the, uh, the uh, school construction task force efforts. I, I was wondering on page seven, line 15. Uh, I'm wondering um, if that might be a little bit of bias in the incentives towards newer and fewer versus that, uh, architectural preservation. Go. Uh, uh, you're not I going to say that it, it, uh, uh, we are uh, not just when we have that basis. Let's I'm not sure if there's a bias in uh, the architectural yeah, preservation. Yeah, yeah, but I'm wondering because it's not outlined in here or if they're even in this conversation. They're not really because they, they, they don't get they don't get about specialized schools. Those schools for other states. I don't know what the right word is. Therapeutic. Unless they're publicly costly, having to chase the safe form and dry, you're never getting ahead, uh, and you're not creating 21st century. I will say, remember that this everything we just walked through to consider and then make our recommendations on. But they may say that's nice. We consider it, and no, thank you. Right. So just because there is a term or a concept listed here does not mean that the state aid for school construction Thank program you. and then will encompass. I don't want to that irritate anybody concept. in the committee, but the I'm wondering how it was conceived because it's not outlined in here anywhere. Where are the individual so schools? Going back to your bill, they're even in those yeah. concepts. What about you know, anything on special for gas fires? Those schools for students, you know, special needs therapy students. So we're going to make any new construction and facilitate those types of students. Great. I don't I understand say, your question. Well, I'm just thinking that as far as we're building, are things that working group you know, we're going to take all education needs into. So certainly ADA would apply. Yes. Yeah, they absolutely. Nice. We uh, that would fall under the catch-all lines right. and accessibility. So just because there is a term or a concept listed here does not mean that we're going to back on that. I mean, just from my limited experience of building a high school. Right now, um, I would say go beyond ADA, you the universal design. ADA bars are high enough that um, we had to grapple with that a lot in our game building. We wanted to have this giant, beautiful staircase with foyer, and after we heard from folks in the community, make any new construction facilitate those types of students? I don't understand your question. Well, I'm just thinking that as long as we're building them. You know, we're going to take all special education needs into consideration too. It would just work. Okay. It, I, so certainly I ADA would apply. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and well, I think that would fall under the catch-all of, you know, looking at ADA compliance and accessibility. Um, so should we have anybody in that group of people we have to receive testimony from that would would be representing that group? I think it's a great idea. Can I make a would you mind if I made a suggestion on piggyback on that? I mean, just from my limited experience of building a high school right now, um, I would say go beyond ADA and do like universal design. I think ADA, the bar is not high enough. And um, we had to grapple with that a lot in our new building. We wanted to have this giant, beautiful staircase in the foyer. And after we heard from folks in the community, that you know that just wasn't universally accessible so we completely redid the big lobby of the school and it's not going to be like that anymore so um i think it's that's an important point how do they can you just say a word about how universal design in terms of a definition i'm not an expert in universal design my sense is just that it really thinks about every different kind of student that could be in that building or or constituent or person 
um, and then it, it <coughs> has them in mind as it creates design features for the right. building. Yeah, I, and I think your point's a great one to have Senator Hashim's constituent in to talk to us about their experiences and some of the challenges they've had. As, yeah, it's a great point. <coughs> Thanks, Ms. St. James. Committee, five minutes after we see the corner <laughs> office, and then yes. we'll continue. Yes. <laughs>